I'm ready now. Hi, I'm I'm thankful. I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for. I I I can't. I don't know how yet. I think for. I'm really thankful for. Um. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for food. Spaghetti. The spaghetti. Yes. I like the book. I like the. Well, sometimes they call them chickens. Probably cheesecake. I said chewy. Orange juice. I think meat. I like to eat donuts. I'm thinking about it. Hmm. I got it. I'm thankful for my friend. Mommy. Uh, mommy, daddy, Meredith. And I'm thankful for, for, for my, for my four siblings. I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters. I'm thankful for my sisters. My mama, and and Jesus and God. That's all I can think of. And by the way, my Aunt Kathy is actually my dad's sister. I'm thankful for my dog. I'm thankful for, for puppies. I'm thankful for when I go to the zoo. I'm thankful for Winnie the Pooh. A lion. A lion. Tigers. They say rah. Mm hmm And monkeys. I don't forgot. I forgot. Dad, you say it. Cobble, cobble. <laughs> cobble. Cobble, cobble. Cobble, cobble. Ooh, I did it. I mean, I'm, I'm potty. Oh, yes. How are you Thanksgiving? Happy Thanksgiving! Happy Thanksgiving! I'm done now. Good morning, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving week. Um, just a few reminders about what's going on. Communion is, as I film this on Saturday morning, happening today. Megan is going to walk us through communion after the message, so you have plenty of time to get what you want to use to represent the bread and the cup. And that's, this can be very liberal interpretation of what this is, but whatever reminds you of Jesus' body, whatever can remind you of Jesus' blood, whatever you have to get together, that is okay. You can use that, and uh, Megan will explain more after the service. Believe it or not, next week we're beginning Advent, and we're still looking for thoughts and taking ideas about what to do and how to celebrate as we are still distanced. I think this is a fantastic moment for us to be creative and to breathe new life and new ways of looking at old traditions. So I'm excited to see your ideas and what is going on. You can email those ideas to fairbornumc at gmail.com. This Saturday is Small Business Saturday, and we want you to take a few minutes and look at the numerous fantastic small businesses that are in Fairborn, downtown, and also just wherever you may be watching this personal favorite of mine is The Bookery, which is a fantastic game store and comic book shop, collectible shop in downtown Fairborn. But there are other fantastic places. Five Rivers Coffee is great for, it doesn't seem like the time of year for it, but there's really never not a time for cold brew coffee. There are a number of wonderful boutiques with, I'll go ahead and say it, some downright sassy gifts for the people in your life. So before you just go on to Amazon Take some time and poke around. There are some wonderful places all around us that might overlook but have some really unique and interesting things. And of course, this week is Thanksgiving, and that means a lot of the usual things, and because this year is this year, it means some different things. 
And so I would encourage you that as we talk about gratitude, gratitude is about being thankful where you are. You know, that's been Megan's big theme and message. And so I know for us, Thanksgiving looks smaller. There is not as much traveling. We've had to be pretty distant from other friends and other opportunities so that I can see a small amount of family this week. Um, but I'm still thankful for what I have. I'm thankful that we can make those sacrifices. I'm thankful for technology so that we can chat and see other family members on this day. So as you do Thanksgiving, however you're doing it, we hope you've taken the time to be safe. And especially that you don't focus on what you can't do this year, but that you stay focused on what we can and on what we're thankful for this week, especially. I'm looking forward to communion. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again, whenever that is. Hope you all have a great Sunday. Bye. just a great weekend so far and even though it's been a little cooler hopefully you've been able to uh, maybe put your Christmas stuff up um, or get ready for this coming week because the good news is is Thursday is what Thursday is finally Thanksgiving and I am so excited because I love the day we get to spend eating turkey uh, stuffing balls um, pumpkin pie sweet potatoes and all of the good things so hopefully you're excited for Thanksgiving now I know that some of us may be a little sadder this year than others about Thanksgiving and, and some may even be, you know, lamenting what this holiday should be, which is completely understandable. I mean, our Thanksgiving plans have been all messed up because, I mean, well, it's 2020. Lots of plans have been messed up because of this year. But the people we typically get to eat with and often spend our day with, maybe they're staying home this year because of the pandemic and the increased uh, risk this year. And the couch sitting and football watching might be from the comfort of your own home, not your loved ones. And maybe you're thinking, you know, Megan, there's really not that much to be thankful or even grateful for at the moment. And I'm not feeling like Thanksgiving at all. And I wish I could make things all better. I wish I wish I had that, you know, kind of magic wand that I could just wave on everybody's Thanksgiving traditions and, you know, make the pandemic go away for good so that we all can get back to hugs and high fives, watch parties, Sunday afternoon gatherings, Thanksgiving meals, and for some of you, those long Black Friday lines you like to stand in. But I can't. I mean, I'm really good, but gosh, I'm not that good. And I know this year will be way different when we celebrate Thanksgiving, but you know what? I promise we still have many things to be thankful for. And I guarantee Thursday can still be a great day if we wake up with a heart filled with gratitude. So, all right, that's my pitch for this week that you kind of gear up so that you can wake up on Thursday morning filled with gratitude. And maybe not Thursday morning, maybe every morning this week, just wake up, not in a lamenting, woe is his life mode, but in a thankful, grateful mode. So we're on our last week of our Lost Art of Gratitude series. Next week, we start Advent, which blows my mind. I can't believe that we're almost already into Christmas time already. But this is our last week. And today we're going to look at the idea of remembering as an act of gratitude and thanksgiving. So to remember something, it's kind of to, you know, bring something to mind, to recall something from the past, whether that past was a few moments ago or whether that past was 20, 30 years ago. When we remember something, we bring it back into focus and into the present reality. And I'm willing to say we remember a lot of things and probably some things that we would probably rather forget. And not only do we remember a lot of things, we typically have things that help us remember. Things like pictures, souvenirs, trinkets, letters, books, heirlooms, songs, 
something that we smell or even see. Or maybe it's even traveling to a certain place can bring back a flood of memories. So I recently went to a park. It's called Daniel's Peace Memorial Park. It's just right outside of Germantown, Ohio. And this park is dedicated to a young man named Daniel who passed away from an overdose. And his father has um, taken this land. I can't even tell you how many acres. I mean, it is a huge space. But he's taken this land and he's created this memorial to his son. His son who loves hunting and just walking out within these woods where this park is located at. It is such a peaceful place. And while I was at this park, I noticed these stones and I don't know why these stones were arranged this way, but what I do know is these stones, they reminded me of two instances in scripture where God's people created stone memorials so that they could remember, so that they could be thankful and live a gratitude filled life for what God has done for them. So one of the first times we see such a creation or a memorial built is in the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua was the individual who took over for Moses. Remember him? Moses was the, the guy who led the Israelites out of Egypt, the burning bush, the parting of the Red Sea, the basket, the plague, with the fight with Pharaoh and all that good jazz. So that guy. So Joshua came after Moses. And God had picked Joshua to succeed Moses and lead the Israelites into the promised land, which was the land that God had chosen for his people to inhabit. And so the Israelites, by this point in their journey, they've been roaming around for 40 years in the wilderness, and they finally get to the promised land. And so Joshua is there leading them into this place, but they have a few issues. And one of those issues being they have to cross the Jordan River. Now, the crossing of the Jordan River, it wasn't as huge of a feat as the Red Sea. However, it was still a very dangerous river to cross. So the Jordan River at that time was about 100 feet wide. And at the particular moment that they were needing to cross it, it was at flood stage, which meant it could easily uh, catch someone in the flow of the stream and take them whisked away downstream to the other end of the river. So when the Lord told Joshua to have the Israelites cross the Jordan, this was not a small task at all. So they started their crossing and we pick up the story in chapter four of the book of Joshua. So this is Joshua four, one through nine. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan from right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off and the stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. And Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. So did you notice anything? Yeah, I mean, what did Joshua have the 12 people do? Yeah, he had them go pick up the stones from the middle of the Jordan and then carry them with them across to where they were camped. You see, the stones, they were created to be a memorial for the people of Israel forever. They were to be a reminder of the moment in time when something incredible happened, when something left such a distinguishing mark in their lives and in the life of the Israelite nation. These stones, perhaps constructed like the ones I saw, were to remind the Israelites of all they had to be thankful for. 
They were to act as a reminder of how God cut off the flow of the water in the Jordan River, much like he cut off the flow in the Red Sea and parted it. But it was to act as a reminder of how God allowed the Israelites to cross safely that day. So memorials, stones, pictures, home movies, letters, trinkets, they all allow us to remember where we came from, what we had to go through, what was lost, what was won, the sacrifices made, the victories, the tears that were shed, and the celebrations that were had. And when we remember a place, a time, a situation, or people, we often remember what happened and why it happened. You see, the purpose for building a memorial of stones in the river was so that the children who came after the Israelites would know what happened in that place. They would know and hear the stories of the sacrifices that were made and the lives that were affected. You see, when we remember what God has done in our life, it brings often immense gratitude. And these stones allow the Israelites to remember and be filled with gratitude over and over and over again. You see, the center of the Israelite remembrance was to be thankful, which would bring praise, which would strengthen relationships. When we omit thankfulness, we are more likely to wander from our walk we have with God because we tend to forget what God has done. We lose sight of all the things that resemble our gratitude when we are lost and in need of help. You see, Joshua did not ever want the people of Israel to lose sight of this moment at the Jordan River, the moment that God let them walk without fear into the land that he had promised them. Joshua didn't want them to forget that God made a way, a way that seemed impossible at the beginning but was possible only through the grace of God. He wanted those who came after to know the story so they could continue to live in gratitude and thankfulness for all the Lord had promised and accomplished. So that was the first story. The first story of, of how I remember, you know, these stones being erected to remember something that God has done in scripture. So the second one, the second story comes that came to mind when I was walking through uh, that park that day was from 1 Samuel. So Samuel, he is leading the Israelites and they come upon the Philistines. They are ill-equipped to battle the Philistine army. And Samuel tells them to stop worshiping foreign gods. He says, return to the Lord and commit to him. So they do this. And the battle with the Philistines ensued. However, Samuel, he began to pray. He began to offer sacrifices to the Lord, and the Lord then made the Philistines go into a panic, which gave the Israelites the momentum they needed to defeat the Philistines at Mizpah. And then we get to 1 Samuel 7, 12, which says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shien, and he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord helped us. So Ebenezer, and this isn't Ebenezer Scrooge, but Ebenezer as in a rock. You see, the word Ebenezer means stone of help. And Ebenezer was a memorial stone erected by Samuel to mark where God helped the Israelites to defeat the Philistines north of Jerusalem. Samuel wanted Israel to be reminded of God's help when they were in the struggle of their lives against this army. And every time the Israelites passed through this area, they would see the stone memorial. They would see the Ebenezer and be reminded of how God helped them on that day. And they were, when they were reminded, what do you think they would do? They would give thanks. And they would be filled with lots and lots of gratitude for what God was doing and had done in their life. And one of my favorite hymns, this word shows up. And the song Count, or Come Thou Fount, not Count, <laughs> not Count at all. In the song Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, in the second verse, it says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. 
Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, and he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. The author said, here I raise my Ebenezer. Here I raise my act of remembrance and surrender to God's help. Here I raise that symbol of gratitude for those moments when God rescued me, helped me, saved me from the dangers and the darkness. You see, remembering who God is and what he has done in our life, it brings us incredible moments of gratitude and thankfulness. You see, to fully trust and obey God, even in the midst of the most difficult moments, require remembering that we have a relationship with a faithful, compassionate, and loving God. And remember, there is, whenever there is sickness, financial struggle, or any other calamity that comes with living in a fallen and broken world, we must remember what God has done in our lives previously and how he has faithfully been there for us, no matter what. And all throughout scripture, we see where God's people either left something or created something in order to be reminded of God's faithfulness, compassion, and love. From the rocks left by Joshua and Samuel, to the lamb's blood on the doorposts, to the Psalms written by David, the sacrificial system by the priests, the acts of baptism and repentance, and finally the Passover meal that's been reimagined by Jesus in the upper room. These are all representations of thankfulness and gratitude, and all of them acknowledge what God has given to his people. So again, we all have something. We all have something that has helped us through various situations in life. We have something that serve as a reminder of those great times in life and also the moments of struggle and the help that we receive from God and other people. So on my window sill at work uh, is a heart that has been broken and then put back together. And you've heard me talk about Kintsugi before. And that is exactly what this heart is. It is a Kintsugi heart. And this heart reminds me of all the times that I have been broken and been put back together. It reminds me of all those times when life wasn't the greatest. And yet with the help of others and God, I have been put back together stronger and more beautiful than ever before. This Kintsugi heart, it is my personal Ebenezer. It is my stone of help. It is my reminder to be grateful, thankful, and filled with gratitude for the grace, love, and mercy that I have been given in life. It is my memorial to never forget what has happened in the past and how far I've come through the grace and love of God. So I ask you this morning, what is your Ebenezer? What is your memorial? And do you have something so that you can remember what God has done in your life? Do you have something that reminds you to be thankful, to be filled with gratitude and gratefulness? And do you have something that you can look upon that is a stark reminder of your brokenness that has been made whole? If you don't, I encourage you to find something. Find something that can help you remember. Find something that can take you back to that moment in the pit where God rescued you, put a new song in your mouth, and put your feet firmly planted solid on the ground. Find something that allows you to once again appreciate the strength and the grace that God has given you time and time and time again. If you already have an Ebenezer, if you already have a reminder or a memorial, good. I want you to look at it. Pay attention to it so you can be reminded and be thankful. And I would love to hear about your reminders, your stones, your memorials, and your Ebenezers. And I want to challenge you this week to share. It is a week of sharing and thanksgiving and caring. But I want you to share with others those times in life when you were at your lowest of low and yet God rescued you. Share your gratitude for the help others gave you, the love others showed you when you gave them every reason not to do so. 
Share your gratitude for the grace that others bestowed upon you. Tell them thank you. Write them a thank you note. Text them a thank you message. It doesn't matter what you do. I just want you to share your gratitude with somebody else. So this morning, I kept trying to figure out just a good way to conclude. And I couldn't think of a better way to conclude this idea of being thankful as we remember than to celebrate communion together. You see, communion is one of the best, if not the best, reminder of what Jesus has done for you and for me. Because it was during the Passover meal with his disciples that Jesus asked his friends and followers to remember and be thankful. And this wasn't a one and done remembering. It wasn't, hey, just for this moment, I want you to remember something. This was a every time you do this type of remembering. And so as Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, they came together and they sat down for a meal. And he took the bread and he looked at them and he broke it. And he said, every time you come together and you eat this bread, I want you to remember that this is my body that has been broken for you. My body broken so that you can be made whole. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant that is poured out for you. This is my blood that will be poured out and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink of this, I want you to remember me. A moment of remembering Jesus' actions on the cross. He invites us to remember those moments with him. That moment when we can come face to face with the grace of God. The moment where we can come filled with gratitude and give thanks for our salvation. And the amazing grace and love of Jesus who crawled upon a tree so that you and I might be free. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment when we can be reminded of all of the things that you have done in our life so that we can be reminded once again of the grace that you shower us with. And Father, in a year where it has been so difficult to be thankful, in this moment, we thank you for our salvation and our freedom. And Father, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice. We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit in the homes of everyone who is joining us this day. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Make these elements of bread and juice be your body and your blood so that we can be and live a redeemed, renewed people. So that by your blood and your spirit, we can enter the world, a new creation, who lives with gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you have done, are doing, and will do in the future. And Father, we know we aren't always the best at giving thanks. We don't always do what we should. And so for that, we ask for your forgiveness this morning. We pray that you cleanse our hearts and our lives from those moments when we are far from grateful, when we are far from living holy lives. We seek your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross. But more importantly, we thank you for the empty tomb. Because we know through your resurrection, we too are free, redeemed, and resurrected people as well. It is in your holy and awesome name. 
And everybody said, amen. So I invite you at your home to take a piece of bread or whatever you have. And I want you to take the bread and I want you to eat it. And I want you to remember that this is Jesus' body broken for us so that we might be made whole. I want you to take the juice and be reminded and celebrate that this juice, even though it's grape juice or whatever you have at home, this is a symbol of Jesus' blood that he shed for us so that we could be cleansed and free. This is the new covenant that he started. And through him, we have life. Take and drink and remember and be thankful. So may you be reminded the next time that you have a piece of bread or a cup of juice of all that Jesus has done for you, may you raise your Ebenezer at your table and may you be filled with gratitude and give thanks. Amen and amen. Dear God, I know I'm supposed to be thankful in all things, in all the seasons, through trials and tribulations and good times and bad, but here I am in the middle of it, sad and overwhelmed. The world as I knew it is gone. People I love are suffering. The life I walk through is suddenly no more. I can't gather around a table and celebrate family. I can't hold hands with those I care about. Instead, grief and despair seem to be eager dinner guests. God, I don't feel like celebrating. But I sit at my table and I close my eyes, listening for that still small voice the one that always manages to rise above all the noise of this life. I hear you, above the sadness, above the fear, above the bewilderment of all that has happened this year. There you are, whispering, be still, and know that I am God. And I close my eyes, and I take a deep breath, and I find my thankfulness in a God who is still in control. Amen.
new series next Sunday. We begin our Advent series, which is so crazy. I, I can't even believe we're doing Advent already. Uh, for as long as 2020 has been, uh, these last couple of months seem to have flown. Uh, so if you are still interested in giving us your ideas for uh, Christmas at home, please send them in. I would love to hear them and maybe we can incorporate a few of them uh, with what we do. So until next week, may you go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us to raise our Ebenezers, to build our stone memorials and remember and be thankful. And may we on Thursday go around our tables and give thanks for all the blessings that we have received, not only this year, but in our life. Amen and amen. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Eat lots of turkey for me and lots of pumpkin pie. And I will see you right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. Have a great week. Give some thanks and I'll see you later.